Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Clark. And on behalf of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Transfer Experience, Creating a More Equitable and Successful Post-Secondary System. While I will not read this, um, the disclaimer, you should know that the recording and a copy of the slides will be shared with all registrants. Please note that this presentation is the property of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, and you must email president at mscge.edu for permission to use any, to use any, dis, um, distribute any part or permission to use or distribute any part of this um, part or whole part of this presentation. Submitting questions uh, for the Zoom webinar. If you wish to submit questions during the webinar, please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your window. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Mo uh, Michael Rosenberg. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our to our uh, pro, to our presentation, the transfer experience, creating more equitable and successful post secondary system. Again, I am Michael Rosenberg, and uh, my colleagues, Dr. John Gardner and Dr. Drew Koch, will be introducing themselves here momentarily. Um, so, I would uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending today, and hopefully, this will be a, a, a educational experience as we talk about our some of our new work in transfer and uh, where we're going to go from uh, where we hope to go from here as far as increasing student success in the transfer world. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite um, as we uh, as we get started I'd like to do take a little time for introductions so I'd like to uh, pass this over to uh, to my colleague Dr. Gardner allow him to introduce himself and to uh, give a little to give a set up, uh, get us set up for our order of the day. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, and I want to ask you too, as a matter of, let me ask you to do that immediately. I, uh, I'd like you and our colleague Drew and I to each say something also about our own work with transfer. And so let me let you do that, Mike, and then I'll pick up and follow you, okay? Sure thing, John. Um, well, thank you. And my, I learned um, about transfer, my interest in transfer started very, uh, very early. I remember when I was um, in high school, I went, uh, I grew up in a small town in Eastern Kentucky called Prestonsburg. And I, when I was in, when back in my day when I was in high school, when Duran Duran ruled the world, um, we talked about, a lot of my uh, classmates uh, would talk about going to PCC, Prestonsburg Community College, uh, for two years and then transferring to Eastern or Moorhead or UK um, to continue their to continue their work. Um, and so that was it was just part of the lexicon. That was part of sort of the, the path from rural Kentucky um, to a bachelor's degree came through uh, that pathway where folks could uh, access an educational experience um, close to home. Um, after uh, I got into higher ed, starting out in um, in residence life and then into academic advising, eventually ended up at, uh, at Gateway Community and Technical College in Northern Kentucky, where I was their inaugural director of transfer, where I was trying to uh, work with an institution where about two thirds of our students were part-time um, to help them uh, ease their way to getting a bachelor's, uh, to getting a bachelor's degree. During the time I was there, um, all of the schools in the Kentucky Community and Technical College system were going through um, the Gardner Institute's Foundations of Excellence transfer focus uh, process. And that is where I met these two uh, wonderful gentlemen. And that's where we began uh, our work on, um, on transfer and which eventually became uh, a book, which we will talk about here in a bit. Uh, but that is, uh, I have now, uh, I'm now the director of planning at uh, Penn State University at the University Park Campus and uh, have been working now uh, with strategic planning with uh, units uh, around the university. So that is uh, my connection here. So uh, John, uh, to, to you or to sure. whichever. <laughs> uh, 
uh, a powerful connection to this work. And uh, in like manner, uh, I'm John Gardner. Um, I am affiliated with a 22-year-old nonprofit organization, which uh, bears my name. And um, uh, prior to that, I was a faculty member for 32 years at the University of South Carolina. I, I would want to confess to you that I am not, uh, in my own personal history, a former transfer student. As a matter of fact, when I was in college, I never met a single transfer student. I've had a lot of learning to do since then. And that learning for me began in 1972 when I was on a faculty committee at the University of South Carolina to design a bachelor's degree that would accept all credits coming from the state's two-year technical colleges. This was transformative. Previously, we had essentially been denying those students admission, and now we started taking all of their hours. It was just amazing. That's a so-called Bachelor of Arts in Interstellar Studies. For 13 years, I was a vice chancellor for academic affairs for five two-year colleges at the university, where I saw firsthand the invidious discrimination that is directed to transfer students, even within the same university family, let alone from students outside the institution. And frankly, it infuriated me and frustrated me. And I spent a lot of time trying to ameliorate those circumstances. As Mike mentioned, uh, more recently, I've been involved working with 70 uh, seven zero institutions in a self-study, and we all know what that is, so the creditor's perspective, um, of institutional performance on transfer. And we'll draw from some of the lessons from that. And uh, I think most importantly, I'm trying to do a mea culpa at this point in my life because in 1982, I started a national movement called the First Year Experience, and I totally neglected, I can't believe it now in retrospect, that I ignored the other first year students of whom there are more than the traditional first year students. And I'm no longer ignoring transfer students. Drew, let's go to you. Thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon to uh, colleagues from the Middle States region. My name is Drew Koch. I'm the chief executive organization of a 22-year-old not-for-profit that bears John's name. Um, I am uh, uh, here to tell you, amongst many things, is that uh, I uh, did not know that there was such a thing as transfer students until 1987. Um, my parents were immigrants to the United States, and one of the many reasons why they came here um, under the broader theme of seeking a better life for themselves and their family was so that their children, yet to be born, could uh, maybe go to, not maybe, could go to college someday, right? So it was always about, probably in utero, I don't remember those conversations, but I do remember the conversations once I exited. Um, yeah the uterus that, you know, my parents talking about when you go to college, when you go to college, and then when you graduate from college. They never talked about transferring to college. So I didn't know you could. And it was actually in uh, early 1987 where a classmate in my first year of college said to me, I'm thinking about maybe transferring that it dawned on me that such a thing was even possible. Um, suffice to state that since then, I've uh, expanded my worldview and my experience with transfer, um, been actively involved in transfer in my experiences before coming to the Gardner Institute with uh, institution-wide effort and even system-wide efforts in colleges and university uh, systems associated with transfer. And then when coming to the Gardner Institute um, in many, many efforts around transfer directly with uh, primary sending institutions, community colleges, transfer sending efforts, and also improvement of transfer receiving uh, efforts at four-year institutions, which is uh, when and how and where that I came to know Dr. Rosenberg, right? So, but I'll also tell you I have another direct connection with transfer, and that's uh, more of an in-house, actually entirely an in-house one. And that is in, uh, currently I have, uh, my wife and I, not just me alone, have four children in, post-secondary education, and um, three of the four are fully transfer students, and all four of the four have had credits transfer amongst institutions, right? And uh, two of those four started in the community college, actually started in ESL programs in the community colleges, and then uh, went on the transfer track and then transferred for four-year regional comprehensive. Um, one started in a uh, regional comprehensive, transferred to a 
uh, public flagship research university and then decided he liked it better where he came from and transferred back. So I've, I've experienced transfer through their eyes and their experiences as well as academically and from a scholarly standpoint uh, from the work that some of which we're about to discuss here and now. So uh, it is good to be with you all. Uh, it is good to be able to share a bit of what we've learned along the way. I won't tell too many uh, kid stories as I do this, right? Uh, but I could, but I won't, right? So anyway, I am. look forward to the conversation and the uh, time we have together this afternoon. John, back to you. You bet. Thanks, Drew. Uh, we're going to do something now that uh, I'm amazed that I remember from my first year of college when one of my best grades was a D in Introduction to Public Speaking. And one of the things we learned was uh, to do something called audience analysis. So we've got three questions we'd like to ask you, all 326 of you that are logged on right now. We'd like to ask you these questions that will tell us and tell all of you something about yourselves uh, that make up this audience. So let's go to the first a polling question. And as you'll see, that asks you what category best describes your, the position you currently hold at your institution. So who are you in terms of your professional identity? And if you would choose um, one. It is, of course, conceivable that a number of you are A and, a and B. Uh, and maybe um, F as well, and, uh, or even E too, but just choose one. And with the help of the wonderful Vicky, actually Victoria at Middle States, we're gonna see some results here in a minute. Okay. Okay, so um, hmm, interesting spread. Okay, all right, you've taken that in. Let's ask you another question. The second one is, and this is really more about your institution. And by the way, I should have stated that these questions are all anonymous, so we can't report any of your responses. But we'd like to know how you would rate your institution uh, with respect to transfer, would you rate it? Um, well, uh, I suppose on the lowest end, transfer, what's that? Uh, there is one institution accredited by middle states that just started admitting transfer students for the first time in its history two years ago, and they only took seven. I'll, I'll protect that institution's identity and not tell you who it is. But uh, so transfer, what's transfer? Uh, low priority, medium, high. One of our goals, we'd love to get you all to high. We even settle for medium. So where are you in terms of priority, do you think, overall? Okay, in a minute, we'll see. Here we go. 17% low. 45 medium, 38 high. Wow, I am impressed with that. I'd love to know what differentiates high from medium and low. That would be a great PhD dissertation, which I'm not gonna write. All right, let's go to the, the third and final question um, at this point, which is asking you uh, what office or unit at your institution has the greatest influence and authority over transfer. To the extent that your institution vests responsibility for transfer, where is that housed? Enrollment management, the chief academic officer, the chief student affairs officer, the chief student success officer, some other. And we're gonna come back to the, the perspectives on this question uh, later in our remarks this afternoon, because it connects uh, directly to how we define and understand and then respond to transfer as an educational experience. So let's see what we've got here for responses. Interesting. 45% enrollment management, 26 chief academic officers, 7% student affairs, 
and uh, actually we have some small proportion of student success officers that are now primarily responsible. Be interested to know what the others are. Um, we did a survey about three years ago, which Mike may tell you about, and we found uh, not quite as high on the enrollment management, but uh, the enrollment management was uh, still disproportionately the most uh, likely institutional subunit with primary responsibility for transfer students. So if anything, that's been confirmed and uh, exceeded. Okay, so just kind of file that away. And now uh, a preview of coming attractions. Uh, I also learned that I got my D in Speech 101 because I learned we should give you an outline. And we're gonna talk about the context for this work we're gonna offer you a new conceptual definition of transfer, which we want you to connect back to the slide where you noted who was most or least responsible for transfer. We wanna reframe transfer very importantly as what we're calling a social justice imperative and part of a larger concept of socially just design. And we're gonna have a section uh, that I'm gonna cover on recommendations for reimagining transfer and we'll look at some next steps at your institution. And I wanna make just a couple of remarks about the, uh, the current context, the initial um, context for, for the work. Uh, and I guess we need to advance the slide here to do that. One more, right, okay. We have spoken to you in our introductions about some of the ways the three of us previously in our career lives connected with transfer, but more recently, in 2016, 17, we had a nine month plan. We, the Gardner Institute, had a nine month planning grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This was a grant that looked at the current uh, state of the landscape nationally around transfer improvement and also any connection uh, to a focus on digital learning. And uh, what the three of us did was we took some of the results from the study we did for the Gates Foundation with their full acknowledgement and support. And we produced a book. We're, you know, traditional academics. So um, I don't remember whether we have a, no, we didn't put a slide in here, but I'll, I'll show it on the screen. Uh, this is the, um, the book, we'll have, a, we'll have a slide later on this. This book is called The Transfer Experience. I quote, a handbook for creating more equitable and successful post-secondary system. And by system, we mean at the national, regional, state, and institutional level. And this was published by Stylish Press in February of 2021. There are 53 contributors to this work, including Dr. Koch, Rosenberg, and myself, and a number of case studies and uh, respective chapters looking at a myriad of different perspectives on the current status of transfer and efforts to improvement. So um, we wanted to acknowledge that. And um, now we're gonna, I'm gonna pass it to Mike and he's gonna give you just a quick data summary on the most salient things we want you to know about transfer for, for this presentation. Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you, John. <clears throat> One of the things that we're that we've tried to do um, with our with with the book and with the work that we've been we've been doing is thinking about transfer in a slightly different way uh, so with a, from a slightly different angle. Um, if you're thinking about tran you know, when and when you mention transfer to many folks, um, in the most traditional sense of what transfer is. Um, is the actual process of moving from one institution to another, moving a student from one institution to another, moving their credits from one institution to another. Um, but that's not the operative definition that we're going to use. And we'll get to that here in a second. Um, when you're in the transfer world, I know that there are some uh, that we tend to, we, we throw some numbers around that tend to be pretty common to uh, within this field. Uh, but I think that it's important and we sometimes forget about them, but I like to go back to the some basics and think about some quick things about transfer students that you may or may not already know, um, but to frame this little, to frame this discussion. Uh, just some quick things. And these are from very, some of our various authors who have, uh, who have contributed uh, to the book. So please, uh, please forgive me for not citing each one um, as, as quickly as I could. But about half of bachelor's degree recipients over the last 10 years 
um, have earned, if not more, have earned credit from multiple institutions. Um, so people having multiple, in, in, uh, into interacting with multiple institutions is very common, if not the norm now. About 40% of all undergraduates enter college at a two-year institution. But of those students, only about a third of them end up transferring. Um, about 80%, when you poll community college students, about 80% of them say that they desire a bachelor's degree. But only about 16% of students who begin, the, who begin their academic careers in that path actually attain um, a bachelor's degree. Um, the plurality of low socioeconomic students minoritized the first time college students first attend two-year institutions, and again, as the beginning of their way through their academic career. Um, this is something that, this is, uh, it, it is the path, beginning of the path that we hold out to say, this, if you would like to get a bachelor's degree and you are, if you are new to this academic game, this is the way that you can go. And well, and that's, we will see about how, as you see from the other numbers, that doesn't always necessarily pan out. On average, transfer students average 15 to 30% additional earned credit that's over and above the number of credits to get a bachelor's degree, uh, as do students who begin at one institution. Now, I know that that can just be numbers, 15% of, uh, of a degree. That's basically an extra semester or two, which is the tuition for an extra semester or two. So that can be something to file away as far as being um, as far as being somewhat problematic. Uh, and finally, about we, in the research that we've done, fewer than 30% of institutions have any kind of comprehensive plan for transfer. So this is something that's only becoming, um, really getting on the radar over the last several years. About So this is just some quick things that you can hold, uh, that you can keep in your head. Now, earlier this year, middle states um, signed on to the American Council on Education's Reimagining Transfers for Student Success Report. Now, this is a very, it was a very good report. It's a very nice report. And it talks about, there were six sort of major uh, areas in this report that you can see. I won't read these uh, all to you. Um, but as you can see, these talk a lot about credit, a lot about articulating credit, uh, pathways for students, um, advising credit applicability, credit review. Um, this is where, uh, this is where we, we tend to talk a lot about when we're talking about transfer and, and uh, interventions for transfer. These are the areas that we tend to, to really focus on. And again, this is not sort of what we are working on. This is not the, um, the transfer definition that we are using. So what is, if, that's, if we're not using this, then what is? And John, this was uh, from, these are John's words. Um, transfer is the totality of educational purposeful, educationally purposeful experiences, which we provide our students to allow them to move to different learning environments and enabling them to pursue credentials which may not be available from their initial institution. To be, and to put that in a little more visual way, let's think about just generally the life of a transfer student. Now, again, as we've already mentioned, there's lots of pathways that students take to get to when they are transferring, when they are moving through the academic continuum, starting at a begin, starting at a, the pre-enrollment, finding an institution, getting initially advised, getting credits evaluated, registering, then moving on to any kind of developmental coursework in gen ed, pre-major coursework, again, more advising, going to this transfer move, moving from one institution to another, and then going through things at the second, at the following institution, second institution, or the third, or the fourth, where you try to get into a major, where you try to deal with any kind of coursework gaps, um, where you're dealing with, and then eventually, hopefully, for some sliver of students, getting a baccalaureate. But most institutions and most work on transfer focuses here on the transfer move. And again, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it's not addressing the experience, the lived experience of a student, which is, Everything that they go through and everything that touches them from initial enrollment to eventual graduation. 
And if we are going to really move the needle as far as transfer success goes, then we need to think more holistically about what these students are experiencing as they go through their, as they, as they go through this pipeline, as they go down these pathways. How do we think about it in terms of this? Because the fact is many students, the majority of students are not successful. They are not successful in getting through to what we say is the eventual goal, which is earning a bachelor's degree. And if, as we've stated, the plurality of low SES, first generation minoritized students, if this is the pathway that we hold out for them to be able to get through, and they can't, and the system is set up in such a way that students cannot get through for whatever reason, then we have a social justice issue. Then we are doing wrong by the students. Then the system, maybe not intentionally, but is discriminating against the students. So if we are going to think about doing this work, if we are going to think about this holistic approach to dealing with the realities of transfer, then we are going to have to reframe transfer, reframe the work that we do, the thoughts that we give as a social justice imperative. And I like to say a few words um, just about this, about reframing as a social justice imperative. Now we talk about this a lot. I would say, I would dare say that most of us in our institutions, if you look in your mission statement, if you look in your strategic plan, you're gonna see a lot of stuff that, that refers to social justice. And so what do we mean by that? We say we sort of, you know, again, we are all for social justice. Social justice is a good thing. What do we mean by this? Well, I, I like when we're thinking about social justice, a lot of times, we tend to go back to this guy here. Now, I don't know how many of you recognize this gentleman. And I would say that probably not many, unless you are a, a fan of um, the ephemera uh, and the history of the United States Supreme Court. Um, but this, uh, this gentleman is Potter Stewart, who is a justice of the Supreme Court. I'm not gonna go into his various decisions and judicial philosophy and whatnot, but he is, he is known in the popular lexicon um, for one quip that he had when the justices were hearing uh, the case Jacob Bellis versus Ohio, which was an obscenity case, where they were talking, they were doing a definition, they were trying to figure out whether something was pornographic or not. And D Justice Stewart famously opined that he may not be able to define what pornography is, but he knows it when he sees it. And that is the, the attitude that many institutions take towards, you know, towards social justice. It's a good thing and we know when we're doing it, but we don't really, a lot of times it's hard for us to define the work that we, that we are doing in this space. So one of the things that we wanted to do, that Drew and my colleague Drew and I uh, wanted to do was provide a frame that we can use to be able to assess work that we do in this area um, to, in so, uh, toward social justice. And as, as working in the strategic planning space, I can tell you that if you're going to do assessment of the work that you do, you need some guiding principles. You need some guiding principles. So what we've done is we came up with um, a theoretical frame for a definition, a workable, what we hope is a workable definition uh, of social justice to be able to look at and frame the work that we are doing. Um, we pulled from a few different areas for this. Um, uh, one of them is uh, from Burton Clark's uh, very uh, famous um, essay that he wrote in 1960, which many people take as a criticism of community colleges, but it's an indictment of both community colleges and four-year institutions about cooling out, that uh, the system is designed so that not everyone will earn a baccalaureate degree, that some, inst that some students uh, by one reason or another, will be pulled out of the system and tracked um, into uh, non-baccalaureate pathways. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of commentary on Clark. He's gone, a lot of folks have gone uh, at him from a lot of different ways. But the fact that it resonates still 50 years later, that question resonates 50 years later, I think is important. Um, we looked at 
uh, some stuff from Bourdieu's social reproduction theory, which is basically them that has gets and design systems so that they keep what they have. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of that sort of work that's tied up in there. Uh, based from Bourdieu, there's some ideas of human capital, which feed into Frankie Santis Lannan's uh, notion of transfer student capital, uh, by which students, uh, as they are moving towards transfer, availing themselves of transfer positive experiences and knowledge, um, will be will be able to more will be more likely to transfer, uh, and will be able to resist transfer shock uh, when they get to their new institution. Um, and also, we also pulled from Dimpal Jain, uh, Bernal Melendez, and Albert Herrera's work uh, on transfer receptive culture and community cultural wealth, which are based in Solorzano's uh, critical race theory and education work. Now, um, they had a book that came out last year uh, called Power to the Transfer, uh, which, is which is a much better uh, discussion of critical race theory and education than anything that I could do. Uh, it's a very interesting piece. Uh, I recommend that book. And Dimbal Jain was one of, uh, she co-authored a piece in our current book uh, on uh, transfer receptive culture and community cultural wealth, uh, which again is a very, which was a very nice addition to the book uh, in that area. So pulling from those areas of theory, we just developed some framing principles um, for social justice to be able to look at whether, uh, how the work that we are doing and how we are uh, going through. Um, it's a four, the, our four principles are as follows. Um, first one is that equity and access and opportunity is a positive institutional goal. I don't know how much we can argue with that. I think we all uh, can embrace that. Um, that systemic conditions such as policies, practices, and processes may inherently advantage some students and some groups of students over others. Again, this is not necessarily done maliciously or intentionally. Sometimes it just is the over years of having developed. Um, so it is, but there are systemic, there are systemic things that need to be looked at. Um, Well-designed interventions can and often do improve outcomes for historically marginalized groups while maintaining and often raising expectations and standards for all students. I think that is important, that piece that it is that it does raise expectations and performance of all students. That has been uh, held out by research that. Um, the more that we focus on these sort of things, the more the better that everyone does. And that ongoing advocacy and continuous evidence-based improvement are necessary for lasting change. Um, that is the, that is our uh, those that's the frame that we've been using uh, as we went through this exploration that yielded um, at yielded the book. Um, but moving again, returning to our returning to our piece here, we can look at this, just for a few examples of where we see uh, this kind of we see this kind of effect, um, starting at the very beginning with the advising that students get when they enter an institution, are they getting? If they do, they know that they're going to need to transfer when they walk in the door. Now, I remember when I was director of transfer um, in Northern Kentucky, and I was talking. We talked to my colleagues at um, at four year institutions. And some of them would be very vocal about how students come to us and they're not well advised or they're misadvised, which I, it's a word that I can't stand. Um, and if that's, and again, do the two year institutions, do the advisors at the two year institutions have the information that they need to be able to, to communicate effectively to their students? And if they don't, the fault is not on the two-year institution necessarily. We at the you know, student or at four-year institutions, we have the responsibility to make sure that students come to us ready. And to if you don't, and if you don't like the level of advising you're getting, well, uh, the, the, the students you're getting, well, that can be changed. Thinking about even something like transcripts, student transcripts. When I was, at, I've been at institutions where if you have a parking ticket outstanding when you are after you've finished your time at an institution they will not release your transcript and if you are a student were they 20 if there is a 25 dollar parking student on your or parking ticket on your record and it's that or a tank of gas i know which way that a lot of students will go and it can be a real barrier small fees small uh, outlays like this can have a huge impact on a student's academic momentum 
thinking about orientation. I remember when I was an academic when I was doing academic advising, um, institutions have a week long orientation for freshmen. They have a week long orientation for freshmen. One of the institutions where I was working as an advisor, the orientation for a transfer student was a one hour meeting with an advisor who basically sat down and said, well, here's where the classrooms are, here's what you need to do, uh, go forth and conquer. Because the thought was, you've done college before. Why do you need a full blown orientation? You've done college rather than being welcoming, being accepting, and being celebrated for choosing to come to, to, for him to, choose, to come to our institution. And major admission, do you have, if you are, if you are in a four-year institution, are your curricula set up in a way that students can realistically, realistically get through a curriculum, get through, to both enter your major and get through in a reasonable amount of time? Again, there's very few uh, pathways that are without bumps, but have you taken a look to see are, is the design of your curriculum such that you, are, that you are getting in the way of student progress? So those are just a few little pieces. And again, we could go into any of those for a long, for, for long dissertation. But for now, I just wanna put that in your head that the design of the system may be such that we can't, that we are not helping students get to where they want to be. And if that's the case, then we do have a responsibility and a socially just and the imperative to be, uh, to fix these issues as we move through. So I hope that's giving you a little something there to think about. If you have some questions, if things are bubbling up along the way, um, again, I would remind you um, that you can pose these questions in the Q&A and we will um, be able to get to these a little down the line. Um, but for now, um, and, th and uh, thank you for indulging me with, our, with setting up this frame. Uh, I am going to uh, pass, this, uh, pass this over um, to my colleague, Drew, who is going to be talking about, uh, is gonna be doing a bit on, uh, on unjust design. And I'm going to uh, turn, also turn the, uh, just turn the screen share uh, over to Drew. So Drew, buddy, it's, uh, it's all yours. Michael, thank you very much. Colleagues, as we think about um, reframing transfer as a social justice imperative, we, we really have to and are prompted to think about transfer as a, as a design challenge and a matter of design. Um, and while on one level that may seem somewhat abstract or artificial, when one examines it as a matter of design, one is com quickly compelled to say, wow, this is really unjust design when you begin to dig into the evidence. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, digging into one example of unjust design of the transfer experience around gateway courses at the transfer receiving institution. And I'll, I'll do that in a moment or two. But before we get started with that, um, you know, one of the design considerations is simply the degree to which transfer is even examined and understood in institutional contexts. So with that as a uh, buildup, what we'd love to know from you right now is just your response to the following prompt, the following question, right? Has your institution undertaken research to compare performance of transfers to non-transfer students? And uh, there are your four options. Again, this is anonymous. So, uh, you know, be your honest, diligent selves, but no, we're not gonna shout you out or call you out in the event that um, um, you're concerned about that. All right, the fact that that poll went down means that Victoria is about to share results with us just to ponder. So you'll note these right now, right? 
under a fifth of yes, not aware of the findings. Um, excuse me, uh, under a fifth of that yes, and you're aware of the findings. A little over 10% yes, but not aware of the findings. Um, just shy 30% no, and uh, over 40% just don't know at all, right? So that gives you a little bit to think about. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time uh, later. Uh, I'll recall that and uh, talk a bit about what it means or doesn't mean, at least from my perspective, based on the worst that we did for, for this book. Earlier, I mentioned the phrase unjust design. And as we were thinking through what does unjust design mean, we also thought through, well, what is the alternative? which is really uh, what we've come to call at the Gardner Institute and now um, nationally and internationally in a uh, series that has involved over a thousand educators from across the globe to date, socially just design and post-secondary education. And I'll refer you to this uh, definition. It's not belabored, um, but it's available out on the web if you wish to access it. But really when we're talking about socially just design and post-secondary education. We're defining the means that post-secondary institutions use, uh, as well as those who work, study within them to actively address the way in which people experience oppression, marginalization within the institutions and the broader systems and communities of which those institutions are a part, right? Now implicit in all of this, uh, and actually on some level quite explicit in all of this, is the fact that uh, it needs to be an active undertaking that uh, not examining uh, aspects or not knowing is uh, potentially a means to perpetuate unjust design and inequitable outcomes. So when we apply that to our work, you know, from the chapter that Mike and I worked on and broader work we're doing at the Carter Institute around transfer, we're, we're left with the, uh, or prompted, to convey the following hypotheses, that transfer itself is an unjust system. A big part of that comes from the unexamined nature and unquestioned nature of transfer, right? Uh, over 40% of you didn't know whether transfer has been studied at all, and um, uh, over 10% of you uh, thought it was, but um, you weren't quite sure where the findings were, right? Now, I'm not here to browbeat you, but that's an exemplar of the potential perpetuation of unjust outcomes through unexamined design, right? And unquestioned design. There was never a chance to even question the evidence if you don't know if there is any and where it lives. So to change that, right? Moving towards a more socially just transfer system, you have to uh, examine the uh, systems and uh, policies and procedures and practice that lead to these inequitable outcomes. Now, we're gonna share with you an example right now of one such system, the gateway courses at transfer receiving institutions. Uh, but we'll also wanna share within all of this is that faculty in the courses that they teach are often overlooked, but they are a primary area for action. Uh, and faculty themselves are primary agents for change in this realm, right? So if you're thinking about transfer simply as an enrollment stage from one institution to the next, and if enrollment management and admissions take care of that, everything's magical and mystical and all are happy. Well, I guess the bad news is that's not true, right? But the good news is you have the means and the capability to begin to expose the unjust design, take a look at this, and then begin to address this, right? You are not without capability and agency in all this work. Now, let me give you one source of that evidence. And this comes from the, the aforementioned book, right? That uh, John mentioned, uh, Mike also mentioned it and drew from, uh, from the uh, Transfers to Social Justice Imperative chapter, right? But in this given case, uh, we're going to be drawing from a chapter called Momentum Stoppers and Equity Blockers, the Implications of Gateway Courses for Students at their Transfer Receiving Institutions. And I had the privilege of uh, co-authoring that with my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Brent Drake, who's uh, currently the Vice Provost at, for Decision Support at UNLV. Now, I will tell you uh, a little anecdote around this as we consider doing this. A dear mentor and colleague of mine for many, many years, uh, 
as she reviewed the chapters, said, you know, I, I was puzzled by your chapter title. I didn't even know transfer students took gateway courses at their transfer receiving institution. What I will tell you here and what the evidence will show is they absolutely do. And if that person who is really one of the best read, most intelligent, articulated people I know um, can say that, that means many of us who are very well intentioned and well read and articulate uh, may not know this, right? So I encourage you to think about uh, these implications as well. Now I'm gonna go a little quickly here so I uh, uh, avoid uh, violating too many rules of uh, PowerPoint. Um, I'll go quickly with circles and arrows that will help me avoid the rules of PowerPoint, right? Um, with a nod to Arlo Guthrie Jr.'s Alice's Restaurant there. Um, what we have here, um, are the data that we, I think Dr. Drake and myself, uh, were able to get from, well, we started with a little over 50 institutions that had been working with the Gardner Institute, largely on gateway course redesign work in a, a project and process still underway with many institutions called Gateways to Completion. And what you'll note here circled are the um, are eight gateway courses. Again, these are at the transfer receiving institution. Now, why did we pick these eight? It, it wasn't arbitrary, but it was convenient, right? These were the eight that the institutions with which we were working at the time were doing the most course redesign work, right? If we uh, updated the list now, it'd probably be a, a longer list, right? But we, uh, at this juncture where there was the most overlap, we're in principles of counting. Uh, intro accounting, uh, general biology, that was uh, intro biology for either major, non-majors. Uh, the same with general chemistry, intro chem, college chem for uh, majors and non-majors. Uh, English composition, the writing course or courses, right? Uh, U.S. history, uh, often called intro to U.S. or U.S. survey. And then uh, first college credit bearing algebra, first college credit bearing calculus, and then intro to psych, general psych, right? So those were the eight. Now in this column, you'll note uh, numbers ranging from 31 to uh, 34. Now earlier I said 50 some odd, um, right? There were a little over 50 institutions to which we did outreach and uh, 36 of those institutions came back to us and verified this is our principles of counting. This is our general biology, or these are our general biology courses. Now we did that because when you look at course titles, they can actually be a little misleading and we didn't want to commit sins of interpretation on our side. So we had the institutions tell us 36 out of a little over 50 completed that exercise. You'll note here 31 to 34 and you say, Drew, that's not 36. Well, the short answer there is, well, that's because uh, in the case of, um, general chemistry, 31 institutions had a general, general chemistry. In the case of uh, college algebra uh, or general psychology or English composition, 34 institutions did, right? So not all of the institutions, all 36, had one of the courses we were considering, but uh, we included all of those that did. You'll note here, um, in the, this column, we have total enrollment across those institutions. And it ranged from, well, over 13,000 students in uh, calculus to uh, over 96,000 in composition, right? So it kind of gives you a sense of the uh, both the scale and depth of uh, courses offered and uh, students enrolled in those courses. Here's the uh, big takeaway in all of this. We, we uh, did a comparison of non-transfer first-year students, right? And we use the term non-transfer because uh, and perhaps it's my issue, but I'm not a big fan of the term native because it somehow implies that transfer students are somehow less than native to the institution. And I can assure you, as the parent of four transfer students, when they transfer to an institution, they very much so wanted to be part of that institution and not de be deemed as an other, right? So we use uh, non-transfer first year, right? This is... Uh, uh, students who entered as a first year student, first time first year student at the institution as opposed to entering as a transfer. In column F, we have transfer students, right? They started somewhere else and they intentionally transferred into the transfer receiving institution. And then in column G, we looked at non-transfer upper level, level students because it, it wasn't sufficient to us for purposes of our research to um, just look at all students, whether they were 
non-transfer transfer. We wanted to know if second year, third year, fourth year students had a difference than first year non-transfer students at the institution. And it does matter in some ways, I'll show you quickly. So as an example, right, to go through this quickly, for general psychology, 34 institutions of the 36 offered a general psych course with a little over 91,000 students enrolled. The average DFWI rate, that's column G, was 25.3 percentage points. The uh, DFWI rate for non-transfer first-year students was 28.4. Uh, there we go. Um, the DFWI rate for uh, transfer students was lower, 22.3. And then the DFWI rate for non-transfer upper level students was 20.2, right? So it kind of gives you a sense. Now, what I'm gonna do now is just quickly show you the blue circles are all the instances where uh, there were the lowest DFWI rates in the courses considered. So you'll see for non-transfer first year students, Calculus was where there was the uh, lowest DFWI rate. Now, I'm not going to argue that a near 35% DFWI rates is low or acceptable, but it is lower than that of uh, transfers or non-transfer student counterparts, right? And we hypothesized in the chapter that it has something to do with uh, uh, how recently it was that students had had a math course, right? So in many instances, we have reason to believe that uh, these were high school students who transitioned to college and went straight into calc. They may have even had calc at their high school the term before, right? So uh, it does give you a sense there of uh, who those students are and perhaps why those DFWI rates were the lowest amongst comparables. You'll note um, in column G, non-transfer students had the five of the eight lowest DFWI rates in general biology, in comp English composition and history, in uh, algebra and in psychology. And then um, interestingly, transfer students had the lowest DFWI rates in accounting and general chemistry. Now our hypothesis there in accounting and general chemistry is, uh, is this. We think that transfer students have the lowest DFWI rates there because it's not the first time they took those courses. We think that uh, transfer students probably took an accounting course or general, general chemistry course at their uh, transfer sending institution, but the receiving institution might have said something like, well, we're AACSB accredited, and therefore your accounting couldn't possibly be as good as ours. Or our labs are top notch, we don't know about yours, so you have to take chemistry over again because it's a lab science here, right? So it does give us, those are at least our hypotheses of some of what's going on there. Now, one can argue maybe the transfer students are, uh, are, are simply better students and do well. Well, that's a fine argument too, but uh, we think there's something more to it than that. And we do think that uh, transfers were um, probably taking the course again because they were required to, not because they wanted to, right? Um, these, by the way, are the instances of the highest DFWI rates. And you all know in five instances, accounting, biology, chemistry, uh, history, and in general psychology, first year students had the highest DFWI rates in composition and in both math courses, transfer students had the highest DFWI rates. And, and for math in particular, we think it's a matter of time away from math, maybe not having math at the transfer sending institutions, things along those lines, right? So quick summary on transfer standing. It clearly matters in complex ways, right? This is why one needs to explore this in depth and not just say, well, transfer students did college before or their courses aren't nearly as good as our courses at their sending institution, right? And that's the example that I mentioned or at least suspect around accounting and, accounting and chemistry. Um, and I may also want to add or do want to add here is that we believe what's good for transfers is good for all other students. So if you are doing a math bridge, for example, for first year students, incoming new first year students, you may want to think about your transfer students and perhaps even your upper level non-transfer students who've been away from a while, how they could benefit for something like a math bridge as well, right? So give some thought again around design unjust design compared to socially unjust design and unexamined design and what you can do once you examine it. 
Now, we also wanted to take a look at elements associated with uh, both family income and race ethnicity. And here we did a comparison within the transfer population. So we were controlling for transfer standing at the receiving institution, but we wanted to know, okay, what were DFWI rates for transfers uh, who may have been experiencing poverty, right? From, or at least they came from families who were and they themselves were. Um, and then also examining it through the lenses of race and ethnicity. So here we have it as an example, and I circled a column there, uh, the DFWI rate for Pell eligible transfer students and we're comparing that to the DFWI rate for non-PEL eligible transfer students, right? So that's our proxy measure here, right? PEL status. We know there's probably reasons why it's not a perfect match, but it's the best available match in the data that we have to, to look at family income, right? Um, and so what we found there, and by the way, what we highlighted there in blue is the one instance where transfer students who receive PEL have the lowest DFWI rate. In all other instances, non-PEL recipients, students from higher family income levels, have the lowest DFWI rate amongst transfer students, right? So family income matters, not just to first-year students or college students in an aggregate, but also to transfer students. And if we're talking about transfer being a vehicle for mobility and social mobility, then we have to consider what's going on in gateway courses. Because remember, these are the students who got into, made it through, and successfully transferred from a transfer sending institution, in many instances, a community college, right? And if we think that is enough to help them succeed, well, this data would tell us otherwise, right? Now, we also looked at race, ethnicity, and uh, we looked particularly at Black, uh, African American, Native American. Latinx students, and we compare it to both the course average, that column D, and also um, the DFWR rate for white students. The blue circles indicate all the instances where uh, a certain population had the lowest DFWI rate. So you'll notice African Americans had the lowest DFWI rate in English, and every other course, it was white transfer students that had the lowest DFWI rate within those courses. So it clearly race matters. Here, uh, you'll notice the instances where various populations had the highest DFWI rates. Now I wanna underscore that these grades are not respective or reflective rather of capability. These were students who already made it through a college experience and transferred and were deemed admissible. Rather, they're reflective of something else that is going on in gateway courses at transfer receiving institutions. And it's something that uh, really these institutions uh, at least had the courage to say, we need to examine and begin to unpack. And what we're encouraging you to do is do the same. So a summary here again, as with um, uh, transfer standing, when one considers uh, family income, looking at Pell, and one considers race and ethnicity, transfer matters in complex ways, right? And I already uh, shared the examples there. And this brings us back to this whole notion, right? Have you even conducted an analysis like this? Who has been involved? What, you, what might you do with that? How will you turn around and take action within those courses? How does that action fit with other systems such as curricula and advising that uh, all your students, including your transfer students experience, and how does your transfer student experience differ from that of other students, right? This is all part of an effort to be much more intentional about design and to apply socially just design thinkings and principles to what you do in the experience, right? So hope this gives you some sort of sense about both where there might be challenges, but where there's also opportunities uh, and where you have agency to undertake some work. We'll certainly talk about this more later when we go on. But what we would like to talk about now is a few more reactions to a few more poll questions. And to do that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my dear colleague and mentor of nearly 30 years, Professor Gardner. John, take it away. Hi again, folks. Uh, yes, a couple of questions we want to ask you. 
and they'll be displayed on the screen here. Uh, the first one asks you to reflect back on Dr. Rosenberg's, uh, as reinforced by Dr. Koch, their definition or redefinition of transfer, where we were arguing in a phrase that it's not the uh, uh, it's not a focus primarily on credits or a period during which they're applying and having credits evaluated, that instead transfer ultimately is about the entire academic experience. It, you know, in summary, transfer is an academic experience. It's not a bureaucratic processing experience. It's not a phase. It's not a, it's not a transition. It's not a stage of development. Transfer is, an, is the sum of the academic experiences. That's what we're asking you, whether or not that makes sense to you. So yes, it did make sense to you. You need to think about it. You're not buying it. Too broad to wrap your head around it. Uh, you're going to start using it. So uh, actually here, I think you can let, if it lets you choose two, you could. And if not, just one. The reason we're asking you to think about this is that what an institution does or doesn't do for transfer and what it makes a priority is all about how you define transfer. If you see it major, major mainly as a transactional process where you're evaluating and awarding credit, then you have an organizational structure that reflects that. But if you see it as an academic experience, you also have to have a structure that reflects the academic components of transfer. They're not mutually exclusive, but it is about priorities. So what are our results here? Okay, I'm, I'm impressed with the first. You do need to think about it. And once you think about it, you gotta act on it because if you buy it, you're gonna change some of the ways you got things structured. Okay. All right, let's let's look at the next one. This is a very this is going to connect to one of the suggestions I'm going to make shortly about recommended corrective actions. But we'd like to know, and so you can take this one back home, particularly if you don't have it. How many of you at your institution have some kind of formal transfer advisory or stakeholder group that serve as advocates? They serve as problem solvers. They do analyses of the transfer bottlenecks. And yes, yes, you do have such. It's a standalone group. Yes, it's part of a group focused on a, the larger issue of student success or retention. No, you, you, you don't, you've never done that. No, but you once did it, but you don't anymore. And you don't know, you don't know which is a fair answer. Often these are not well known, even, even for institutions that have them. All right, let's see what we got. How many of you got one of these? This is a no cost. Um, oh my goodness, only 25%. Then if you add it as part of the larger focus, you're up to uh, what, about 53%, 52. Uh, never, uh, you once did, hmm, wonder why that went away. You don't know, 20% don't know. The, I think we can reasonably assume that for many of you, if you don't know, you don't have one, okay. All right, now I'm going to pick, pick up at this point on what we're calling some recommended actions from our work. I told you earlier, we have 53 uh, experts contribute to this, and uh, these slides to follow pull the uh, recommendations from those experts, okay? The first one is, if you're going to do anything better that you're doing now on your institution, you have to make it a larger priority, okay? You got to readjust is the status of this focus in the institutional pecking order. Because um, basic principle here is the way you're organized right now gets you what you're getting right now. You wanna get better results for transfer, this has to be a higher status issue. Okay, so how would you go about doing that? Next slide. Well, uh, you put this in the mission statement. Your mission statement would reflect um, some institution-wide commitment and you'd be showing middle states this because middle states reviews your mission. And they ask you every 10 years, what are you doing to meet your mission? And what evidence do you have? And what are you doing with that evidence? So you put it in the mission statement. Rarely do we see reference to transfer students in institutional mission statements. Recently, I was at a middle states uh, institution where um, over 70% of the students are transferred, no reference at all 
in the mission statement. Okay, um, where is it? Is it in your strategic plan at all? That if, if it's not, it's not gonna rise to the same level of priority. What about the talking points that your institutional leadership makes every time they go to the faculty senate, the board of trustees, the Rotary Club? Is there any reference to transfer students? What about the actions, the symbolic actions, the high public, high priority, high public actions that your senior leaders take? Is there any reference to transfer students? The mantra, the metrics that go in your institutional mantra, what you report on regularly, which you all focus on, are transfer outcomes even ever in these metrics. Uh, you know, IPEDS has only been having us report this for a couple of years. Finally, it's entering that system. So um, another thing you can do is to, to the extent that you have access and influence over your CEO and your CAO is to urge them, invite them to talk about this. You also have to have uh, certain offices and officers, individuals responsible. And we don't know of any institution that has significantly improved transfer without rethinking and uh, adjusting where needed the relationship between enrollment management and academic affairs to reflect a more balanced focus on what really is transfer. Namely, it is both an academic and a uh, transactional process. Another way to look at correction actions is to see that um, you got to start with the end in mind. Where do you want to get? In this case, we want to produce more transfer students. Fundamentally, ladies and gentlemen, the transfer problem in American higher education is a pipeline issue. We're not producing enough of them. And the pandemic has further inhibited our ability to do that transfer students are down, especially because community college enrollment is down. Um, I'd like to ask you, even at the risk some of you may say or put in the Q&A section that this is an oversimplification, but I'd like to ask you to consider there are two types of students in American higher education. Any undergraduate you see walking around, uh, he or she is one or the other. He or she is either a transfer student or a non-transfer student. And about 50% of them are transfer students. As uh, Dr. Rosenberg said, this is now the normative route to a bachelor's degree in the United States. So everything you look at, you could say, how are we treating our transfers versus non-transfers? And one of our big takeaway conclusions is that the, the educational experience of a transfer student is fundamentally different from the non-transfer student. You may, um, Mike referenced the uh, history of the Supreme Court. We know that in 1896, the court ruled that separate railroad cars that differentiated persons on the basis of their skin color were equal and therefore could be done, called for at the state level, as long as the accommodations were equal. We know they became separate, but not equal. That was in the case in our public school systems until 1954 and in our public higher education system since the Civil Rights Act uh, or until the Civil Rights Act of 1965 and the Higher Education Act of 1965. So it's only been very recently we've had any legal support for ending these separate and unequal experiences for these students. So if you accept that it's a pipeline issue, folks, we got to get more students through the community colleges. So what do you do there? You have to drastically revamp orientation. We have to introduce to all of their new students some kind of focused career planning. We have to dramatically improve academic advising, particularly the stunning ratios of advisors to advisees, often 1,500 advisees to one, horrible ratios like that. And we have to go another step further with gateway, uh, with, excuse me, with guided pathways. Uh, we've spent an enormous amount of time redesigning the pathways that students are marketed to and urged to enter and follow. But what we haven't done is to redesign many of the courses in those pathways, which are still failing high numbers, DWFI rates, very high, even though they're now in this sexy new pathway. We've got to pay more attention to the impact of faculty on transfer decisions, especially the role of advocates. If most community, but not all community colleges have college success courses, we definitely need to differentiate sections between for, for transfer bound, non-transfer bound. And as uh, because my colleague, Dr. Rosenberg has introduced me to this, and now I've learned a lot about it. If you don't have a transfer center, that is something you really need. Transfer center staff by your own staff and by individuals who are employed by your transfer receiving institutions. 
But the same, uh, some of the same cases can be made for four-year institutions. We need to rethink there. Not only do we have orientation for new students, for transfer students, excuse me, but do we require them to participate? Most institutions do not require transfer students to participate in orientation. We would argue that's a mistake. Um, some of you, but by no means all of you, have some kind of very um, uh, accepting and generous bachelor's degree with respect to accepting transfer credits, like the Bachelor of Arts and Interdisciplinary Studies that I agree, that I helped design. You definitely need to have one of those. And again, more attention to uh, the transfer and taking pains to listen to the stories that transfer students will tell you about how their experience is or is not different from other students. Fundamentally, in four-year institutions, the treatment of transfers is like a medieval cottage industry. And the colleges are the respective baccalaureate degree granting schools and colleges, and their transfer student treatment varies widely. So one thing that's needed is more attention to what we want to provide in common, the comparability, parity for the kind of tra experience that transfer students say get in engineering versus business versus liberal arts. Um, again, the uh, the role of the chief academic officer in baccalaureate level institutions to hold some kind of common standards for transfer and making transfer more of an educational priority. It's one thing to get into a baccalaureate unit, but it's quite a different matter to, uh, to, uh, to ever complete the degree. The, the third item is to uh, collect more and better data Third slide, please, on um, understanding your students. What kind of data do you need? Well, it's, if I don't say this, Drew will uh, give me a nudge. And that is the most data, meaningful data you need is disaggregated data, disaggregated by race, gender, ethnicity, first generation status, Pell status, residential status, et cetera. And only then do you get a more nuanced picture of who's performing better than others and what does that correlate with. If you have transfer students coming from multiple institutions, you need to know uh, what do you predict about how successful they're gonna be based on where they came from. How many credit hours are they bringing? Who is more or less likely to get a bachelor's degree from your institution as a function? How many credit hours they begin? Uh, excuse me, they bring with them. Then again, what is their specific, what are the specifics to their academic performance as well as in terms of where they came from? All right, the next recommendation is to do the two most dreaded words in the higher education uh, accredited lexicon, undertake a self-study. Voluntarily put everything on the table that you are doing for transfer students and uh, ask uh, how effective is this? We can give you a simple free tool to do that uh, on the Gardner Institute website, you'll find uh, something called foundational dimensions for transfer excellence. These are nine standards for how to achieve excellence in transfer. The fundamental educational question is, if you were excellent in transfer, what's that mean? What do you have to do? How do you control that? These are available free, no charge. We also have a, um, a, a transfer excellent design process for which there is a charge. You can use the standards. Please, we encourage you to do that. Um, the major goal of a self-study of your institutional approach to a trans transfer is a comprehensive plan for transfer improvement, which Mike told you earlier, most institutions lack. How do you get better at anything without a comprehensive plan? Well, the answer is you don't. Um, another recommendation, number five, is you must improve, uh, excuse me, involve faculty in more discussions about transfer, particularly faculty that brings into alignment the sending and receiving faculties of sending and receiving institutions by discipline. And you have to review the extent to which do you, the extent to which you give faculty, academic department chairs, for example, authority for discretionary review as to which courses do or do not uh, gain transfer credit and to try to equip them with better data on which they could make those decisions rationally, fairly, and lacking any form of capriciousness. Um, again, we know that uh, transfer, the, the, the type of educator has the most direct contact with students are faculty. 
And so we have to engage the faculty more in this work. Another whole line of this uh, work, we have a chapter on this uh, in, uh, in our book, and it's about what we call institutional barriers to transfer. And barriers are generally created not by state governments, not by the federal government, other than the federal financial aid system. Most of these barriers are created by those of us who've worked in institutions or who do work now. And you need to examine uh, what are they? How significant are they? They, are, they barriers are formed and found in policies, offices, and individuals who operate in the most common of institutional human ways as barriers. There are certain offices that are that have come to pose tremendous hurdles for transfer student advancement. And again, th this is under our control. These don't come from Moses' tablets. In our book, there's a chapter on this written by John Fink and Davis Jenkins from the Columbia University uh, Community College Research Center, really excellent. And you could use that as a template for examining your own barriers. Another strategy is to um, undertake a policy audit. This is where you audit all your policies by category. It's missions policies, financial aid, eligibility for on-campus housing, if you have that, priority for class registration, um, means to access required versus elective programs and opportunities, from orientation, advising, study abroad, uh, internships, externships, uh, who gets co-op learning opportunities, who doesn't, national student exchange, on-campus employment, uh, who's eligible or not for academic prizes and awards. Um, you, you examine how your policies directly impact transfer versus non-transfer students. At the same time, you do an audit of your website and you look at how to what kind of reference is there to transfer students on the components of your website that describe admissions, financial aid, registration, advising, orientation, on-campus employment, career services, counseling, housing, athletics, you have those student activities, parking, transportation, childcare, health services, opportunities for employment. It's all there. Um, one of the ways you improve the performance of any group is by changing your policies. Many of your policies you've had for decades and you don't examine them, and you don't even know who developed them, and probably the persons who did are no longer living. Uh, very simply, next recommendation is, what do you know about the history of transfer students? How do you celebrate those? How do you, do you have a section in your campus museum, your campus library on this? Do you have any exhibits? Do you celebrate uh, the history of people who have uh, been true advocates? How do you publicize their accomplishments and reward them? Um, we, we need, you know, do you, go, do you see anywhere, do you see photographs of transfer students? You see awards they've won? How visible are they on your campus? Uh, very simple, no cost recommendation is establishing the stakeholder group. We've just referenced that. You, you've told us how many of you do or do not have that. Highly recommend that you do that. Um, the peer to peer relationships, hugely important between sending and receiving institutions. These are relationships between your chief academic officers, your chief student services officers, chief enrollment, chief financial aid, chief business, chief library, athletic, um, chairs for certain disciplines, people who run learning centers, um, and most importantly, uh, advising. Uh, you've got to get people together in communities of practice from uh, sending and receiving institutions. A uh, very simple strategy, we would urge you to survey your students and ask them, remembering if you can't stand the answer, don't ask the question, how transfer friendly are you? What do your students think of you? Get, you, you know, you gotta know this. Um, one uh, middle states institution, uh, New York State, has a statewide association for, um, uh, for transfer related issues. They have an annual meeting. Um, I don't know if any of your other states do. Um, there is the annual meeting of the National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students. We highly recommend that. That institute is almost 20 years old now. Um, but the main point here is encourage uh, colleagues, especially get some of your faculty who normally don't think about transfer students, get them to go to some of these professional development experiences. Uh, it, the, the New York State group that I was referring, it's the New York State Transfer and Articulation Association. Um, so what we'd like you to do is to think about this definition of transfer, your definition of transfer, and how is it that you define transfer and how does that apply to the things that you're, um, you're focusing on? Just a couple of final thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. This urgency, this issue is urgent. Transfer students, many of them are suffering. 
they are experiencing tremendous headaches, runarounds, frustration. You need a transfer advocacy system. I'm wondering if some of you might even want to have an 800 hotline that students could call in and get some attention, at least you know, register their um, concerns in some form that, uh, that would document the extent to which you've got students who are experiencing this. Um, our nonprofit organization uh, this year, we finally got involved in an exciting project that is that we're looking, we're working with four states and a grant funded by ECMC Foundation to try to develop a system of excellence in four states, uh, Colorado, Washington, uh, North Carolina, and South Carolina. I'm sorry, there's not a middle states institution there, but we're developing a model that we hope uh, your eight states um, could use in the future. Um, I think that one of the things that's operating here, ladies and gentlemen, is a phenomenon that nicely or neatly parallels uh, 4 million Americans who haven't gone back to work. Students are not coming back to us because they're fed up with the status quo. They're fed up with it in the work environment, in the college environment, and we have to do something about that. Uh, one of the things that is contemplated that is actually being addressed in some states now, as some of you know, is what I call the nuclear option. The nuclear option is to solve or to attempt to remediate, ameliorate the supply problem once and for all, and that is to gradually permit more and more community colleges to offer baccalaureate degrees. Uh, if you look at the past hundred years of community colleges, they were originally designed to specifically keep certain categories of American citizens out of baccalaureate institutions because we don't want them um, you know, on our doorstep. And uh, we have a chapter in our book written by a historian on this. And gradually we have been admitting, thanks to the federal government post 1965, more and more of those students to baccalaureate level uh, institutions, but not yet enough. And uh, if we don't get our own house in order, the, uh, the modifications of the American higher education system to permit greater not only access, but success. We've been working hard on access, but we don't have a success equation. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Um, thank you for consideration of those recommendations. Um, Mike and Drew, back to you for the um, comments on the questions, the comments. Thanks, John. Um, we do have we we do have some questions here uh, from our from our uh, folks in the audience, and I'd like to pose a pose a few of these uh, in the time that we have left. And thank you all for thank you all for uh, for being with us again again today. Um, here's a, a question for us here. Um, it says thank thank you for your analysis. Are there institutions that we can look to as exemplars of good practice in this field? And I think that there are a number. Um, yeah, and, Mike, I'm wondering, I th think we can answer that in multiple ways, right? But I think that question popped up when uh, I was in the process of going through the evidence on gateway courses. I'm gonna answer it from the gateway course standpoint but then I'm gonna ask you two gents to answer it from a perspective other than gateway courses, right? So it, it, we can give both there. Um, I, I uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at um, how primary sending and primary receiving institutions come together to do this work and look at what type of success and preparation is necessary uh, at the primary sending institution and how then students fare at the primary receiving institution. An example of this uh, is the relationship that um, the University of Central Florida and Valencia College have fostered on their direct connect effort. That is not simply examined or defined as a um, you take courses here, they transfer there, and we're done. It really is an ongoing conversation, holistic review that includes discussion amongst you know, the highest academic leaders, as well as uh, faculty advisors and others in, in that effort. Now, we have worked with, the Gardner Institute has worked with UCF and they in conjunction with Valencia it, through a self-study process. Um, I don't believe they connected that with their uh, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools 
reaffirmation for accreditation work, but they could have very well. It was a full-fledged self-study. And uh, so I, I think that is a wonderful example of how that's done. If you'd uh, like a primary point of contact, I'd encourage you to speak with Isis Artsvega, who is the uh, chief academic officer at Valencia now, uh, sounding like an NPR session. I do need to divulge that she's also a fellow at the Gardner Institute, right? So she, she knows our work fairly well. But um, that's one example where uh, success and foundational level experiences, academic experience and knowledge in courses at the sending institution are understood and contextualized with experiences in gateway courses and other courses at the receiving institution, so that it's not a matter of blaming the sending institution or rewarding the receiving institution for hard work that happened at the sending institution, right? It's a combination of looking collectively. I'll turn it over to others to, to uh, John, we, Mike. We have, um, in the book you can see on the screen here, we had a dozen case studies 10 of them are in, an, in our in an online compendium and those include a case from Kane University of New Jersey and of um, the Charles and Stella Gutman Community College in the City University of New York and another chapter more broadly on the uh, CUNY um, history with transfer in the uh, other part of the print connect, print book there's a very detailed case history not only on central florida but on another as a matter of fact the largest um, public higher education institution in the United States where the key to that enrollment growth has been transfers, and that's Arizona State University. Really an extraordinary story of how you know, there you have a national transfer phenomenon. As I recall, we, there's another national institution, an institution that's become nationally uh, uh, prominent through transfer, and that's Southern New Hampshire University, which is drawing students from your region. Um, but we, I would refer you to some of these case studies. I, I would I would just echo what John said there. Um, I can't. I would. Not, there's not much more I could add there. Let's see. <clears throat> One. We have a question here. I'm from a two-year institution. We have challenges with our most common transfer institution's willingness to share information with us as to how our transfer students are doing. Uh, is this something that you examine as a barrier, and what can be done uh, about that? I would like to say to that, that's it's where one of the recommended actions I had was on peer-to-peer -peer leadership. That's where your, um, your chief executive officer, your chief academic officer, your chief enrollment management officers have got to get together with their counterparts to get the IR officers to provide the information. Uh, this information, uh, even for private institutions, it's in the public domain because it's now reportable through iPads. And uh, it's all about uh, using personal and professional relationships to get these parties together, to talk with each other, and to share this information. Uh, we have found in the Gardner Institute that the, one of the instruments or the catalyst that's most likely to stimulate action is the data about what really the outcomes from the current systems we have. Mike, you reported one that to me is just stunning. When you know that 80% of the students who enter America's two-year colleges indicate they ultimately aspire to a bachelor's degree and only 16% of them within a 10 year period are earning that degree. That is shocking, ladies and gentlemen. How can we, we, can, we cannot afford to continue to perform at that level. And there are a myriad, uh, as Drew illustrated, a myriad of data set points that will motivate your faculty. When, it's, when you see what's happening to your transfer student performance in gateway courses, this is unconscionable that you would allow this. This is fixable. Just a cut. I know I realize that we are that we are at time, but I am happy to take a few more questions here uh, as we since so many folks have decided to uh, to have chosen. We two hundred and thirty three, Mike. Yeah. Um, if we choose to shift the definition of what it means to be a transfer student, how do we avoid shifting the blame and responsibility to the community college? I'm glad um, that question was posed. And I, I, I'm not simply speaking for myself here, at least I believe I'm not, but I'll invite my colleagues to, to add to this. I will say that uh, transfer, as given our definition, has to be understood as a systemic issue and a systemic problem. And I don't mean a problem in a pejorative sense. It's a problem that can be solved if one examines the design 
And that design originates and culminates across institutions. It's a shared responsibility. So uh, rather than thinking, well, if only they would have completed the associate's degree, if only they would have done this, if only they would have done that, and look entirely at the transfer receiving institution. As you see what's transpiring in uh, courses at the transfer receiving institutions, they were, these were students deemed readily admissible. They were absolutely admissible. They were admitted. Something happened in the gateway courses then at the receiving institution. So part of it is uh, a willingness and it's, it requires uh, brave, open candor. And, uh, but a willingness to say, hey, this is unacceptable and this is unjust. And we all bear a role and responsibility to do something about this. That does not mean give everyone an A who didn't earn an A. That does mean our institutions are clearly not earning A's right now with regard to what they are doing in this, with regard to unexamined and unjust design. So from our perspective, it cannot be and should not be viewed as us saying, oh, if only the community college were to do better. And by the way, our definition of transfer, at least our analysis on transfer, yes, for the book, it's vertical transfer that we primarily focused on from community colleges to four year. But in our work, um, one of the, uh, or actually the National Student Clearing House shows this, the next largest set of transfers occurs from four years to either other four years or four years to two years, right? So transfer works in multiple manners has to be examined and under, understood as such. So I just want to sort of put a uh, sort of flag in, in uh, the sand and, and, and just say, you know, we're, we're, we're claiming and naming that this is a shared responsibility uh, and not simply a, oh, if only community colleges would do better. It's a pipeline issue in both sectors. We need more students who are successful, who, who've been able to earn credit at the two-year level and not dropped out there to be able to move on. And then that we don't lose them in the four-year level. It drew, you really nailed it. It's a shared responsibility. Absolutely. Got one here. We'll do a couple more. I said, I work at a community college in articulation. In regards to the data shared in the introduction, the majority of transfer students are not successful. Is there evidence to suggest that students who transfer as part of an articulation agreement are more successful than those who transfer without such a degree or prior to earning an associate's degree. Um, and there is, there, is some, um, there is some data around uh, associate degree uh, completion. Uh, it's, I don't think it's incredibly robust along those lines. What, I, what we do find, and it depends on how you define what an articulation agreement is. If it's just, if we're talking about just, um, an articulation agreement with, that defines coursework. That's just this course is equivalent to this course. Um, there's not there's not going to be probably a great um, a great impact as far as that goes. However, if we're just talking about an articulation sort of agreement where students at a sending institution are able to access resources, whether it's advising, whether it's taking courses at reduced rates, uh, where, it's, uh, where they're able to participate as a student on um, a receiving institution's campus before they've actually matriculated or are in the pipeline to matriculate. Uh, there is evidence that those stu that students um, on that realm are, are, uh, are more successful because they've already built um, a connection and have uh, meaning made for being a student at that four-year institution. There is, when, there, when those sort of relationships where the students are moving back and forth, we've been, I've been a part of putting together a couple of those uh, sort of thing, uh, sort of those agreements myself, in addition to a lot of the, again, the case studies that John referenced earlier, uh, where there are these tight connections between sending and receiving institutions, those will bolster success rates. So that's, and those really are uh, worth, uh, worth pursuing if that is something that is within your power to do. 
We did have a case study on uh, one example that would, uh, which you remember well, Mike, that to this question, and that is whether articulation agreements in effect produce more students through the pipeline. And this is a study of a project sponsored by the Western, Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education. It's called Interstate Passport, where there are now uh, given, given 20 or so states that have developed compacts to take block uh, acceptance and transfer students. Now, this, we didn't address this at all, but we, you know, one of the many myths about transfer is that it's primarily a local phenomenon. And you know, we this thing called the United States, we have people who constantly are crossing lines now, and online education is making this even more likely. And um, so you might want to look at um, Witchy's interstate passport as a model for that for the response to that question. I, I want to um, highlight something that um, I think this um, enlightened audience gets. I don't think the broader populace, and particularly not our transfer students, I don't think they frequently, if at all, get it. Right, and that's not meant to be pejorative. But there's a vast difference between having an accredited, excuse me, an art articulated uh, set of credits that transfer, right? In the absence of that, you need it. And actually knowing if those transfers apply and fulfill degree requirements. And they're often two vastly different things. Um, and unfortunately, often, even within institutions, we don't know the degree to which uh, articulation agreements actually uh, manifest themselves in reality. In other words, do the articulated credits that a student brings in actually fulfill degree requirements? Or are they treated as elective or distributed credits and then the student needs to potentially repeat courses, take courses over again, right? And that is the, the piece that even if you have an associate's degree can lead towards more time to degree, and certainly in the absence of thereof. So as a matter of fact, it, uh, it emphasizes or enhances the, the desire on the part of students to not complete the associate degree so they don't have a lot of lost credit in the process of uh, doing this work. So I would highly encourage you, um, we've been doing, I've been at an opportunity to do a little uh, thinking about this uh, with uh, Shawi Abdullah from uh, Georgia Tech and also Greg Holloman from the University of Arizona, looking at George Akerlof's research on uh, asymmetric information where there's a lot of information and we're applying it to the transfer pipeline Acker level applied it to the used car marketplace but um, there's a lot of information that's not known by either the student or even potentially the um, institution itself that is taking the student in until after the student's already been admitted and enrolled right so looking at the difference between what you guarantee via uh, articulation and what you actually apply to meet degree requirements. I think that's where there's another possibility and opportunity for mitigating issues with unjust design. I, I see that one of you, Jesse Kane, asked us, and I quote, though less common, have you thought about transfer students in graduate programs? And I'm really glad that uh, this question was posed to us because Drew and I are actively moving right now to um, look at um, the whole issue of completion rates um, and who, who does and who does not complete in graduate programs, which is truly one of America's best kept dirty little secrets. So uh, stay tuned, but Drew, I, you know, I don't, in, my, in our conversations with our partners on this, we haven't really looked at it through the lens of transfer, um, but of students who originate, but uh, this has given us something else to think about here. Just love these questions. They're very provocative for us. We have one, I have one more question that I'll throw out there uh, for us. Um, and is that, and obviously we have, uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, uh, here are our, our emails, which you certainly can. Um, and the question is, the, the question is this, um, what would be the one and or first thing that you would suggest a receiving institution do? Uh, moving ahead. And I'll, I'll, I'll just throw my quick response out there. And I think the most important thing that a receiving institution can do is to understand who your transfer population is. I think that that in the, um, in the, the places where I've worked at four-year institutions, it is not widely known how even how many transfer students exist on a campus. 
Uh, I think that's that's been true almost everywhere that I've worked. Uh, and I think that that in and of it, that that could be that would be my suggestion for the first thing that you could do is know who these students are, know who they are, know where they're coming from, and see how they are performing. That is what uh, just get yourself a good baseline for who these folks are, so that you can start working to to uh, to bolster their success. Uh, I think John, see if John and Drew have additional yeah, things. I, that's where I, I would. Do if I could be CEO for a day and an institution to do this, uh, I would declare my version of a Marshall Plan for uh, transfer students, which meant in effect when it was the Marshall Plan was implemented in Europe after World War II, uh, we had to totally rebuild the structures for society and align them with a number of democratic principles and the kinds of outcomes you get from a, a more democratically organized system. And uh, you, you truly have to redesign uh, our higher education system was not designed for these students. And what we're doing now is uh, add on corrective majors to, uh, um, to ex post facto do that. And uh, so we need, we need, quite simply, we need a plan, an institutionally based comprehensive plan that looks at everything you do for transfer students. It has to be redesigned. And I'll pick up on what John shared. Uh, this is a, a, uh, a design matter and is a matter associated with either a, a more just and transparent design or a continued um, uh, sort of occluded and unjust design, right? And um, I'd encourage you at the very least to, uh, with peers from uh, either a transfer sending, if you're a transfer receiving institution or transfer receiving institutions, just strike up a conversation and begin to look at the evidence that you do have and see what questions that leads to. I wholeheartedly encourage you to uh, try to dig in as quickly as possible into the evidence associated with uh, various demographic splits, right? Uh, family income, um, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, there are other splits that you can certainly look at, but uh, I think the uh, the sooner you make this a, a very transparent conversation around equity, the quicker it it, it begins to tug at both heads and hearts, and and uh, moves folks to uh, uh, put those hearts in their hands into transforming a system. So uh, start with a, a peer at a sending or receiving institution. Start by digging into what you have and build from there. Drew, I want to give two uh, concrete examples of what you just talked about. Um, we discovered a few years ago a community college that learned that uh, its students that were being sent to a world-class AAU research flagship university, those students were denied eligibility to hold any office in any student organization for the first year of their transfer experience. They could join a student organization, but they could not hold office. And when I, you know, I learned this, this is grounds for a, you know, a class action lawsuit. And now I mentioned this because it's illustrative of the gross prejudice that exists against some of these students. And uh, you know, these are, these are uh, learned patterns. And uh, so uh, you, you don't know unless you, um, you've got to ask a lot of tough questions about how your place really works. I had an experience once with an institution that had a policy, blanket policy. They would not accept any more than 30 hours from any community college in the country. I asked a cabinet meeting there why they had that policy. Not a single officer in the cabinet could answer the question other than, well, we've always had this policy. So it's uh, these unexamined elements of the design of your system that you have to address. They are implicit. They're baked in and they're discriminatory. Well, yeah, ask why, Yeah. then why not, then why not? right? So. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for participating with us here today. This has been, I hope that you've taken away some good information. Uh, again, please feel free to reach out to, to any of us. So we were happy to answer whatever questions we can. Uh, but we appreciate you taking some time to, uh, to listen to this, to hopefully take some uh, and take heart in. Uh, we are all in, we are all committed to transfer student success. And we would like to continue this conversation with, uh, with you moving forward. 
So any last words, John, Drew, before we, uh, before we sign Thank up? Thank you, best wishes. And we appreciate on a very operational level, the two um, uh, signers from, uh, for the representatives from Gallaudet University who signed for us. Really glad to have them here. And we thank our Middle States host for inviting us to do this. They, they have all kinds of experts they can invite for you folks to support your work in the region. It's a privilege to be affiliated with your regional accreditor. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a, have a good afternoon, everybody. Take care. Thanks.